So hopefully that was enough time to knock out the warm up. If not, keep working a little bit while I begin the lecture. And uh, if even that's not enough time or if you're just arriving and you haven't had time to check it out, please don't forget to go back and do it either at the end of today's lesson or after school today. Um, keep in mind that our unit ends today at 1159 p.m. So in order for your assignments to be turned in on time, I am asking that they're submitted by that time at 1159 p.m. Additionally, we will be starting our unit seven, our seventh unit tomorrow. So we're making good progress. The sixth unit does not appear very often on the EOC exam. Biotechnology is not one of the kind of core principles of biology right now. So we try not to spend too much time on it. We will not be taking a unit six exam. We're just going to jump directly into unit seven tomorrow. Unit seven is a highly important unit. So we're gonna spend a lot of time on that. And it's really important that you all either establish better habits based on your performance last semester. And that's why I asked you yesterday to take that midterm uh, reflection survey to think about it, or you just keep on with the habits that you established that worked for you last quarter. So um, please, please, please folks, Going into this next unit, we're gonna be talking about some, some new stuff. We might even involve some math. All right, so it's gonna be very important that you all are taking notes as often as possible. Keep that in mind. One more thing that I need to mention today before we jump into the lesson is something that is on my heart, definitely, and something that maybe is on uh, your hearts as well, and I do wanna talk more about it tomorrow, but uh, tragically, we did witness violence enacted in Atlanta, Georgia on Tuesday night. Eight people lost their lives to what most people would describe as a domestic terrorist. Six of them were Asian women. And it is something that is unbelievably sad, but also something that I think as young people, you all are probably wondering why it happened or uh, you know, what the impetus for that amount of hatred and violence is. We don't yet know the motive of the domestic terrorist. We don't yet know exactly how everything played out, but it's still important that we talk about the fact that violence and discrimination enacted against the Asian American population here in the United States has increased dramatically over the last year since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic. It's been exactly 53 weeks since the coronavirus became uh, or was designated a pandemic by the World Health Organization. In that time, we've heard major figures in our society, including the President of the United States, make very discriminatory and racist remarks about the country of China, about Chinese people, and about Asian people more generally. So it's important that we think not only about the discriminatory remarks that were made over the last year, but also how those discriminatory remarks are a reflection of a history of racism that has affected um, Asian Americans since they, you know, came into this country in the late 19th century for the most part. So I want to talk a little bit about that tomorrow. But first and foremost, let me just say that if this is something that is stressing you out, it's okay because whenever we see such vile and wanton violence in our society, it should elicit some amount of response. We should not ever hope to be numb to that amount of hatred and, and, and dismay. And when it happens, we need to have people who we can talk through these, these things with and talk through our feelings with. And as young people, I'm sure you've got someone in your life, hopefully, and I, I pray that you all have someone in your lives whether it be a parent or a sibling or a friend or a coach or a mentor or a spiritual leader who can help you think through these things. But if not, then I just wanna reaffirm to you all that I am willing to be that person. And it's part of my job, at least how I see my job, to be there for you all when, when things are maybe a little confusing and, and maybe a little sad. So uh, if you are feeling confused, if you are feeling disappointed and frustrated and scared based on what, what you've learned about, um, those murders in Atlanta, that is a normal reaction. It's a healthy reaction. Um, and let's, let's think through that. Let's think about why we feel that way. Let's talk about some of the history. That's what I plan on doing tomorrow, but don't 
don't forget that I'm always going to be here for you all. That's all I wanted to say about that today. All right, so today's lesson is about bioethics. It's March 18th, 2021. It is the fourth and final day of our sixth unit. The objective today is to conceptualize the benefits and dangers of the expansion of biotechnology into our daily lives. The essential question, how and where should society draw the line when it comes to biotechnology? That's a pretty broad question, but I really want you all to think deeply about it. And that is going to be a part of your asynchronous assignment when we're done with this lecture today. How and where should we draw the line? When is enough enough? When are we going to say, nope, we might have the ability to do that, but we probably shouldn't. That's what we're thinking about today. So now, can't see you all, can't hear you all, but I imagine that on the other side of this screen, you all are taking out your notebooks and you're getting ready to write some, some very brief notes. We won't have much to write down today, but we should still be in the habit. Okay, let's see. Just want to shout out Sally because she scheduled an appointment to meet with me. That's something that I'd love to see, especially for my honor students. You all are the students who I'm expecting fours and fives from. And so one-on-one -on -one time, even if it's just to clear up a quick question like Sally has, is a great idea. So please feel free to use that resource. Use my time. It's already available to you all. And I'm happy to help you with even small things. All right. So Again, the question that bioethics begs us to ask is now that we know that we can do something, should we do it? Now that we know that we can alter DNA molecules, we can alter the genes of organisms, should we do it? Now that we know that we can use viruses as vectors to, to get vaccines, uh, should we do it? Now that we know that we can very healthily um, abort pregnancies. Should we do it? Now that we know that we can create pesticides that allow plants to grow in places where they perhaps could never have grown before, should we do it? Now that we know that we've got chemicals that can allow us to allow apples that were picked in October to still be sold in March, should we do it? These are questions that bioethics pushes us towards. And I want you all to think about some of those questions as well on the next slide. But bioethics is the study of ethical issues emerging from advances in biotechnology and medicine.
There are some additional questions that I think are relevant right now. Oh, here they are, in bioethics. Could people only be allowed to travel on planes if they've gotten the COVID-19 vaccine? That's gonna be a question that's gonna be difficult for us to answer as a society over the next few months. Vaccines, you know, I think I just read that uh, the 100, no, what was it? I can't remember, but we, we've we reached a milestone with the number of vaccines that have been administered. Maybe one of you knows the number, I can't remember it specifically. But so as more and more people are vaccinated, the president announced last week that by May 1st, there should be a vaccine available to any American adult who wants one. Um, they're now starting to do clinical trials with young people. Uh, so maybe you all will be able to get vaccinated by the end of the year as well. The question will have to be asked, should we force people to be vaccinated in order to travel? Maybe a specific airline will, maybe a specific airline will not. Maybe a specific country will say, hey, if you wanna come travel here uh, and you're from a foreign nation, you need to be vaccinated. So this is a question that will come up. Should students be vaccinated for any number of diseases in order to enroll in public schools? We know that this, is, this has been common practice in most American schools for the last century or so. Children have been required to be vaccinated for polio, required to be vaccinated for measles, required to be vaccinated for uh, the bacteria that causes chicken pox um, and several other things as well. Of course, there are populations of people in the United States who don't agree with vaccine vaccines. We call them colloquially anti-vaxxers. Uh, and that's kind of seen as a derogatory term, but these are people who don't believe that vaccines offer a benefit to their children and might actually be harmful. So should we force children to be vaccinated before they enter or enroll in a public school? The question that has to be asked. Should a person be allowed to refuse vital me medical care for religious reasons? So one of my favorite TV shows of all time is ER. You guys, some of you weren't even, may not have even been born when ER was uh, at its height of popularity. But ER followed around, it was kind of Grey's Anatomy before Grey's Anatomy, if you're familiar with that. It followed around a group of doctors and looked at their personal lives as they kind of looked as they as they treated patients for various diseases and injuries. And one of the themes that kind of came up in a few different episodes over the course of 15 seasons was the person who has had a traumatic injury but does not want to be treated for various reasons. It might be because they're old and they don't want to be in a hospital any more than they have to be. It might be because of their religion. But the doctors face this dilemma because the doctor's primary priority is to take care of their patients, to make sure that their patients leave them better than they came. And so uh, if a person comes with a traumatic injury and they don't want to be treated for it because of their religion, uh, that is a difficult, that's a difficult dilemma for a doctor to have to navigate. So again, bioethics, we know that we might be able to treat those traumatic injuries better than we maybe could have 100 or 200 years ago, but should we do it if a person does not want it to be done? All right. And then it could even be even more complicated if the person is not conscious. So that's something to consider as well. But when we think about bioethics, of course, we see two words appearing here, biology and ethics. Bio meaning life, ethics meaning kind of morality. So ethics are moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. And bioethics therefore applies those principles to biological, scientific, and medical advancements. So we can think about this in a triumvirate way or a tripartite way. We see these three circles that, are, that together form this Venn diagram. We've got legal issues, we've got ethical issues, and we've got scientific issues. All of, the, all of these come into play when we're trying to decide, again, where do we draw the line? If we can't answer questions about the legality of something, do we need to draw the line? If we can't answer questions about the scientific implications, maybe we know what the short-term benefits will be, but maybe there will be long-term dangers that we don't yet know. Maybe we should draw the line there. What about the ethical issues? There are always gonna be ethical issues.
So one of these topics that is kind of close to home for you all is the use of social media, students' students' use of social media while in school. Um, it presents legal issues, it presents ethical issues, and it presents scientific issues, believe it or not, because uh, we don't yet know, we, don't, we can't fully understand uh, at this point what the long-term implications of social media use will be, because social media has not been a thing for for long enough yet we need to we need to be able to study how it impacts people over the course of decades not just over the course of six seven years so as you all get older um, we'll have the ability to better understand how social media has impacted your lives when you're 40 50 60 years old um, and so in many cases as is the case in charlotte mecklenburg schools schools have actually taken steps to actually just ban the use of social media um, using blockers that prevent you from, you know, updating your social media feeds while you're in the school building. The legal issues of that also come up. Can schools legally do that? Can, can they prevent someone from having access to their private social media um, pages? Or can they, are they responsible for posts that are published while in the school building? Um, especially if it's things that are taking place in the school building. If a student records a fight, for example, that happens in the school and, and then publishes it immediately to Twitter, is the school responsible for that post? And then ethical issues as well. Um, you know, sh should teachers be responsible for collecting phones when students enter? Uh, is that putting students in danger or is that protecting them so that they don't have to worry that someone might be recording what they're doing in the class or that, you know, their bully does not have access to them during the school day, things like that. So that's just one topic, um, how cell phones and social media have this, these bioethical implications. So I've asked a few different questions now that are related to bioethics. Oops. But now I want to know, can you all think of any? Are there any other questions of bioethics that you all can think of? Aren't they planning on decreasing the making of robots and stuff because humans lose control over it? This is, yeah, so this is a big concept, Sally, um, a big idea as well. We are not yet at the, there, there's, there's a specific test that can be applied to robots um, to determine their amount of autonomy essentially how, how how much control do they have over themselves um, we're not yet at the point where computers and robots are able to kind of disassociate themselves from human beings and start building their own computers and their own robots so in that way they for lack of a better term don't have the ability to reproduce a computer is not yet capable of essentially by itself making its own computer. Um, but there are tests that are showing that computers are getting closer to that ability. Um, and, you know, IBM, if you're, if you're a fan of Jeopardy, as I am, I'm a big Jeopardy guy, um, Jeopardy once had a computer um, go up against three human contestants and the computer, IBM Watson was the computer basically destroyed the human beings and all it was doing was you know and technically jeopardy shouldn't be a game that should be really easy for a computer to to win at because the questions are entirely open ended and it's not like we're looking for a huge cache of possible answers we're looking for one specific right answer and so for a computer to do that faster than a human brain and in, in, in this in the case of jeopardy and only a couple of, you know a second or so is pretty impressive um, so computers are gaining intelligence, um, but it, it's, I think that's a good point. You know, one thing that I was talking about with my last class is one of the problems with bioethics is the scientists who are coming up with these technologies and these devices and these medicines are making the decisions for the entire planet. There might only be a team of scientists that is maybe 10 people big and they're developing these technologies and they really only have to answer to um you know their own scientific community or to what's called an irb an internal review board 
And this internal review board just makes sure that the protocols that those scientists are following are ethical, making sure that they're not taking advantage of human beings or um, underpaying scientific participants in their research studies. Um, but they're making decisions that could ultimately have implications for the entire planet. And so is that fair or should we all have a say in whether or not these science, th this science should be developed? It's, it's, a question, it's an important question to ask. And as it relates to computers, that's a very, very important question. Maybe we as a society need to have a discussion. Maybe we should stop developing such intelligent computers for fear that you know something that we've seen in Black Mirror might actually come true. Um, so it's an important it's an important thing to consider. You're right. Can we think of any other questions of bioethics? Janelle, you've seen ER, huh? That's a great show. I've seen every episode. <laughs> Can we think of any other questions of bioethics? I know you guys are more creative than this. I'm sure there's a question that you're wondering about as it relates to bioethics. Should a person have a choice in, in a choice of having medical assist, like in like COVID, um, having like how can I say have medical assistance even though they don't want it? Good. And I thought you were going to go a slightly different direction with that. Um, but that's one of the videos we're going to watch today. Medical assisted death, doctor assisted suicide. So let's, let's take a look at this. More commonly known as euthanasia, probably. A 17 year old has become the first minor to die by euthanasia in Belgium. It's the first application of legislation adopted by the country in 2014. It allows for the doctor assisted death of minors of all ages if the condition is incurable. The patient is said to have been critically ill, but no other information has been given. Firstly, happily, there are not a lot of minors in a terminally ill condition, he says. Secondly, doctors use a recognized method in that they put the patient into an artificial coma in the end, what we call palliative sedation. Belgium legalized euthanasia in 2002. Two years ago, it amended the rules to permit doctor-assisted death for minors of all ages, the first country in the world to do so. In the Netherlands, it's possible for children age 12 and older. The fact that we made this possible means a lot of people who are faced with a terminal condition have found peace of mind because they know they can ask for euthanasia. They might decide not to ask the question, but the fact that they can makes a huge difference for a lot of people. Records from Belgium's National Euthanasia Control Committee show that between 2003 and 2013, 8,752 people ended their lives by euthanasia. Okay. So what do we think about that? I mean, obviously we think about, and I see your message, Josue, I'm gonna read that in a second. Um, we, we, we hear about euthanasia as it relates to our pets. I used to have a pet hamster when I was probably eight or nine years old. His name was Cuddles, and Cuddles ended up having cancer. Um, and it was quite sad for my sister and I, but he needed to be euthanized in order to kind of, uh, you know, keep him from experiencing a painful life. So we hear about euthanasia being used for our pets quite frequently, but now we are thinking about doctor assisted suicide with humans. So what do you all think about that? Um, I think it should be up to the person. 
Can you say more about that, Dijon? I mean, if they feel like the Sabres is like they're really, really sick and their pain is kind of like unbearable and they just want to like end it all, I think they should be able to like make that choice. Okay. And uh, Janelle, you were, Janelle, you were saying something as well. Did you want to jump in? Oh, I was saying I was about to say it should be up to the person. Okay. But it reminds me something out of this book where it was this two men and um they had to like go work on a ranch or whatever. And one of them was mentally ill, so he didn't mean to do stuff, but he did it. So he like killed one of the people's wife on accident. And um his friend knew that they was gonna kill him, so instead he like shot him in the head so he can die instantly instead of dying slowly. And that was in a that was in a book? Yeah. That's not, that sounds interesting. You, send us the name of that one. Maybe we can all check that one out. Um but yeah sometimes in the case I don't I don't know that I'm not sure if anybody or any countries around the world are doing doctor assisted suicide for mental health reasons, as is the case that, you know, that was what Janelle was just talking about. There was a mental health um, problem or a mental illness, I should say. Um, but yes, in the, in the case of physical health illnesses, or why am I saying it like that? Physical illnesses. Um, it has been done, especially in Western Europe. Oh, that's of mice and men? Okay. Thank you, Ashley. I didn't yeah. even realize that. Okay, great. Um, that's funny. When you were describing it, I didn't realize you were talking about of mice and men, but it has probably been like twelve years since I read that book. So um, maybe I should go back. Yeah, I was gonna say that was definitely a middle school book. <laughs> um, Josue, I like your point as well about this anime. Um, it sounds like an interesting anime as well, but we know that humans have created pretty severe problems, um, not only for other humans, but also for other animal and plant species when we think about their or our impacts on, on, on the ecosystem. And sometimes, you know, it does push us to these scientific or these sci-fi questions of wondering what, what would we do, you know, if we had the ability to make one singular decision that could impact the entire planet. If I was the one person who might be able to say, mm, I could bring everybody back or I could just allow uh, society to kind of restart and, and see what could come of a more peaceful place. Who knows? Hopefully we're never in that position. Science, man. But yeah, okay. Well, what's, what's it called, Josue? Send us that in the chat as well. And Sully said, oh yeah, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico People who are really sick and can't move or talk anymore, they need air tubes to live. They aren't allowed to die even if they want to because I think living in pain without being able to do anything without a possibility is way worse. Yeah, so this has been a question that I think has been asked in American society. And of course, Puerto Rico is a American territory. But uh, in American society over the last 30 or 40 years, there was a doctor um, who was operating primarily in, in the Western states of the United States who uh, would essentially record himself um, administering euthanasia to his patients. And these patients, you know, he would ask them to sign several documents. He would record them on several different occasions over the course of many days saying that they wanted to die. Um, and these were people who had diseases like ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, which basically you know, your muscles um, just start to wear down and, and um, you, you gradually lose all functioning. First, you lose it in your extremities. Then you start to lose it in your uh, upper arms and legs. You, you can't even eventually you won't even be able to move your tongue to eat or to talk. And, and eventually the muscles that allow you to breathe stop working as well. And that's how you die. But uh, this person some of his patients were suffering from ALS. And so they were like, you know, I want to die a dignified death. I want you to be able to choose how I die. I don't want to live this life, you know, in which I, I literally cannot move any parts of my body. Um, and he would, like I said, he would administer euthanasia to them. His hope was that 
um, he would be sued or he would be arrested. And this would take it to eventually the Supreme Court where they would be able to battle it out in the courts and say once and for all, is it legal or is it illegal to administer euthanasia to human beings? It didn't exactly work out like that. So you should check it out. Um, check out that story to see how it ends. I won't spoil it. But yeah, that's a big question of bioethics. So let's talk about something else. Designer babies. This came up in class on Tuesday or maybe it was Monday, but uh, we do now have the ability to literally alter um, genes and we can alter the genes of, of human beings in ways that allow us to highlight what we might consider good qualities um, and get rid of what we might consider bad qualities. Of course, the nuance here or the caveat is that we, as we know, there will always be an interaction between human being, I'm sorry, between our genes and our environment. So even though we might be able to change the genes of babies, who knows if their environment will actually support these qualities coming out, even though we might be able to give a child uh, the genes that make their, their brain better suited for high intelligence, meaning we might be able to give them better short-term and long-term memory. We might be able to give them the genes that create better connections between the left and right hemisphere of their brain that give them a strong, stronger corpus um, callosum, which allows for uh, interconnectivity between the halves of the brain, give them a better frontal lobe. Uh, but at the same time, if that child is never placed in a school or is placed in a, in a bad school, then they might never become highly intelligent. Same thing goes with athletic skills. Yes, we might be able to give someone the genes that allows them to have a stronger muscle tone, more flexibility, maybe a little bit more height, longer limbs, <clears throat> um, a bigger rib cage to support, you know, better respiratory abilities. That does not necessarily guarantee that they will become a, a good athlete if they're not exposed to training and coaching, or maybe they just won't like sport. Maybe they will choose to do something else. Um, so all of these things are not guaranteed by anything we can do genetically but they, we, we can change the likelihood that a certain outcome might happen. Let's watch this video and then I'll ask you guys to share your thoughts. Have you ever dreamt of having awesome superhuman powers like the X-Men? With recent improvements in gene therapy, the reality of having designer babies is closer than ever. But this begs the question, if you were having a child, would you want to pick and choose their traits? Is this even ethical? And how far can the use of these technologies actually go? Remember, we post new content every single week, so subscribe to our channel and click that bell icon so you don't miss out. Now, back to the video. The phrase designer baby refers to one whose genetic makeup has been altered or chosen to provide the desired genome. There are currently three technologies that have been developed to enable this, all of which involve manipulating fertilized eggs before in vitro fertilization. The first one is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This is the simplest of the three methods and doesn't involve any gene editing. Instead, it involves choosing between viable eggs for the one that best satisfies what the parents want. For example, it can be used to screen for diseases or even to predetermine gender. The second one is talons, transcription activator-like effector nucleases. These are enzymes that can be designed to remove specific parts of the DNA strands. They then replace the section, thus allowing edits to be made. In theory, this technique can be used to target any section of DNA and has been used to design plants, fuels, and even pets to certain specifications. The third one is CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, and it's a process that was discovered in the DNA sequence of certain bacteria. Their DNA contains snippets of the DNA of viruses that have previously attacked them to allow them to recognize any threat in the future. The method by which this new DNA becomes a part of their own has been replicated to allow the modification of other DNA strands. This again, in theory, allows edits to be made to any part of the genome. So can these methods be used on humans? Of these three, only the use of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is already being used for human pregnancies, with the first known case being as early as 1988. 
there remains a long way to go before the other two methods are deemed safe enough for human use. And as far as we know, there have not yet been any uses on a human embryo. Despite only one of these methods being currently used, there are a number of options that are available to parents. Eggs can be screened for gender, appearance, intelligence, disease, and personality. Of these, the most common type of screening is for diseases, particularly for couples who are at high risk of passing them on to their offspring. Screening for other aspects remain highly controversial, and in most countries, illegal. Crucially, this technique doesn't allow the editing of the genome, but the ability to choose between already viable eggs and decide which one to proceed with during pregnancy. Another emerging technology is that of three-person babies. This is a procedure that means a baby has three genetic parents, with the third person providing the mitochondrial DNA. This can prevent the development of issues such as muscular dystrophy and certain heart and liver conditions. So what are the future possibilities for designer babies? As scientists perfect techniques of genetic manipulation, especially those of Talens and CRISPR, the possibilities that become unlocked are theoretically endless. It would become possible to design every part of the genome whether it's eye color, hair color, disease resistance, or far more advanced traits. What if you could increase brain function, muscle mass, or eyesight? Lifespans could be lengthened, or perhaps new human abilities could be developed. So much so, that creating real-life X-Men could come within the realm of possibility. But we have to wonder, how will this change society? While regulations prohibit these types of changes, the technology will become so prevalent that more complex designer babies are sure to happen at some point. There are clear benefits to this. It would reduce genetic and inherited diseases or conditions, the child would have a better chance to succeed in life, lifespans would increase, and children could be given genes that their parents don't possess. But a number of negatives are associated with this as well. There would be an increased number of terminated embryos, which many believe already constitute as living beings. There could be damage to the overall gene pool, children would have no choice on how their genes were altered, and there would be a loss of individuality as everyone became more like a generic ideal. Furthermore, some genes could have multiple purposes, and if changed, could have wildly unpredictable consequences, and it could lead to the development of new diseases and vulnerabilities. The main ethical issues about gene modification is the question of who determines which traits are good or bad. We risk eliminating unique and different people from society, and that is a problem. The process of designing a baby would also be incredibly expensive, <coughs> at least in the beginning. This means that it would be something only accessible to the rich and lead to further inequalities in society. The ability to create designer babies is far closer than we might think, and in some cases is already taking place. While it seems like there are many benefits to procedures like this, our desire to control every aspect of nature could potentially lead to our downfall. Thanks for all right, what do you all think about that? <clears throat> what do you all think about designer babies? Share your thoughts with us. Did any, go ahead. So it, so it explains to us that the designer babies is kind of like if, if every baby was like the same or it was like different, because that got lost in some, in some ways. Okay. Um, I think that's a good point. So we might, we might assume that if everybody had the ability to create an ideal baby, we might lose some of the diversity that we see in the human population because people would be working towards similar, if not the same ideals. So um, we might end up with the same, with the same baby kind of being repeated. Um, good point, Lisa. Thank you. Or good question, I guess. Dijon, did you have something too? Uh, I agree with you. Like, that, like we lose diversity part, and I was saying, like, what if one day it just like goes wrong, for, like all the experiments and stuff. Yeah, that's a good point as well. Even you know, and I I, I can kind of conceptualize it in this way, uh, or give it context in this way. When we think about the COVID nineteen vaccine. Um, you know, scientists were conducting different clinical trials, working with people with different diseases, people of different ethnicities, people of different ages, um, of course, people of different sexes. And they determined after, you know, a couple of months, and of course, this was an accelerated process because of the urgency of 
COVID-19 pandemic, but they determined over a couple of months that this vaccine was safe for people across all of those different identities, older people, younger people, at least old, younger adults. We haven't, we're still figuring it out with kids. But one thing that they cannot have tested for is the impact over time, or if there is one, we still don't know if the vaccine protects you from the coronavirus forever, or maybe it will just be for six months. Maybe it'll just be for two years. We have no, we don't, we can't, we can't know because um, there hasn't been enough time passed yet. Um, so as it relates to these babies, you raise a good point, which is that um, we might be able to, you know, edit a baby's genes and know that maybe for the first years of that person's life, they are, they have better eyesight, they have better intelligence, they, you know, so they're able to read earlier and speak better at an earlier age. But we might not know what the impacts could be when they're 30 or 40 or 50 years old because we just haven't been able to test it. What we do know is that um, in, in the case of, for example, Dolly the goat, who was the first goat to be cloned, uh, she, only lived to be about four years old because, and that, that's a short lifespan for goats as I understand it. Um, and was she was exhibiting traits of a much older animal. Um, and that could be because that when, when tampering with the genes in some way, um, that we're, we're having some impacts that we just aren't aware of yet. So in the case of Dolly, they were pretty sure that something went wrong in the process of mitosis as she was developing. and. Um, the clone that was made didn't really officially reset. They took the nucleus from an older cow, the nucleus from the, um, not cow, but from an older sheep, and they cloned that nucleus. So they think that something happened that didn't officially reset. And the nucleus essentially kind of thought it was older than it was. Um, and that led to Dolly having traits of, you know, having some diseases that were really only common in older goats. So there are some things that we just can't understand until until we try it, and this this is another ethical reason. Um, yes, Janelle, is this similar to IVF in vitro fertilization? This is very similar to that. And in fact, when making clones, it is done in vitro, and in vitro just means it's done in, in a test tube. Um, so the way it works is that, um, and this is, if you really want to know about this process, I would definitely encourage you to take the AP biology class. But what, what happens is that um, they take a fertilized egg from one sheep or one monkey, as we're about to find out, or just a fertilized egg from any animal. They uh, then take the nucleus from another, they take the nucleus out of the cell of another sheep or another animal, and they put it into that fertilized egg and so now the fertilized egg has essentially, it thinks that it has this new nucleus that really has all of the genes of this other animal. Then they implant that fertilized egg, which now has a new nucleus, into a third sheep or into a third animal and um, impregnate that sheep and that animal. And it, it, the baby develops inside of that sheep. And so it literally is developing with the exact same genes as that second sheep. There is no, you know, there is no mother father from, you know, from the original fertilization process. It's literally the exact same nucleus that came from that second sheep. And this is how they've, they've made clones. And this is done inside of a test tube with needles that are thinner than a human hair. So it's an extremely complicated and uh, process that is really a big scientific advancement. Now, Sudley brings up really the most important point, I think, which is that this science is currently being used to help people who might be more likely to develop diseases um, to avoid that. So there's a great documentary on Netflix called Human Nature that, that talks about this, but gene counseling or genetic counseling is a way that human beings can um, work with the scientists to figure out what diseases their child might likely develop. And uh, we can we can help them to avoid that by tampering with the genes a little bit. So there's the benefit. We know the pros. There might also be cons to that as well. All right, let's watch this video.
purpose of doing cloning of monkey and use、uh, monkeys as、uh, experimental animals is really for the human health,、uh, for the curing of human disease. There are many other animal models you can use. You can use mice, and that was widely used. But there has been difficulty、uh, in using that as an animal model for the human disease because mice are very far away from humans. Okay, and then eugenics. This is a big concept as well. We've talked about this a little bit. I don't want to say too much about it right now because I do want you guys to do this assignment at the end of class. But of course, eugenics is the idea that、uh, there is a, a more superior race of human beings, and that、um, we should be doing all that we can to kind of get rid of the inferior races. Um, in favor of the superior races, so that we can literally improve the genetic composition of the human race. This is obviously a pretty racist idea.、Uh, it was the idea that was practiced by the Nazis, and and in their in their process, they killed six million people,、um, and the vast majority of those people were Jewish. And they believed that the Aryan race was the superior race, and that. You know they could eventually come up with this master race of people, and that the entire world would just be these blonde-haired, blue-eyed people. Of course, that was extremely racist, and、uh, it led to World War II, in which you know millions of people died. But they actually got that idea from the United States of America, where there were quote-unquote scientists who were practicing the same idea when it came to Black Americans. Black women were being.、Um, What's the word? Sterilized, you know, without their consent, meaning that they were、um, going through medical procedures that prevented them from having children, because these scientists believed that、um, it was their duty to kind of get rid of this inferior race. So eugenics is a highly discredited idea.、Um, it's, it's considered a pseudo science, but、um, it did elicit bioethic concerns even today. I'm gonna skip this for now. Skip that. Skip that. All right. I do want you guys to get to these assignments, and you'll be able to share your own ideas. Obviously, there are a lot more questions as it relates to bioethics. In fact, maybe we can take a look at these just to give you some ideas.、Um, so, growth hormones in chickens sounds like a good thing. We can think about some of the positives, but there are also negatives as well. Pest-resistant crops sounds like a good thing. It allows us to make more crops, but there are negatives as well. Vitamin-enriched rice. Um, negatives to that, believe it or not, as well. So, think about some of the good and some of the bad, and that's what you'll do as a part of your assignment today. We've got 17 minutes left. U6 D4 bioethics discussion is the assignment that I'm talking about. What I'm asking you all to do is write your own post,、um, explaining where you think we might draw the line as it relates to bioethics. Where should we say enough is enough? That's that we've gone too far. Um, and talk about that. There, the specific questions I want you to answer are already on Canvas. <clears throat> Excuse me. But、um, that's what you're thinking about. Your second half of that assignment is to respond to two other posts. So once two other people have posted, I want you to respond to that and share your thoughts about what they've said, whether you agree or disagree. So your goal here is to take a side. It's not just to be like, oh, they're good and bad. It's to say, nope, this is good, this is bad. That's where I stand. Okay. And then you're going to comment on some other posts that you see. Obviously, be respectful.、Uh, I I don't doubt that you all will do that. I don't think you. I don't think I have anybody who's disrespectful in this class. So I just say that as a reminder. And then for my honors class, so you guys specifically, I do want you all to upload those student data trackers. Um, into an assignment on Canvas that's also called U6 D4 Student Data Tracker.、Um, some of you, I know most of you did it on Friday this past Friday because I was actually looking at your screens as you did it. So now your goal is just to upload it there.、Um, if you haven't done it and you're confused about doing it, we can definitely talk about how to do it. I know I'm meeting with Sally later today to to walk through it, 
And then of course there's an exit ticket as well. So 15 minutes now, that should be enough time to, to do these things.
Sally, I'm just seeing your message, but um, the the DNA is negatively charged. This the end of the gel that's closest to the wells is also negatively charged. The end that's furthest away from the wells is positively charged. Hopefully that makes sense.
All right, folks, it's now 1230. So you all are good to go ahead and get ready for your fourth block class. I look forward to seeing my rotation B folks tomorrow. And other than that, have a great day. Thank you all. Peace out. Peace, Peace out. out. Thanks, JT.